Good evening. I'm Jean McCormick, and I have the privilege of being the president of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, and the privilege of welcoming you here tonight to this wonderful replica of the United States Senate. You feel like you're there. I was just saying to our guests who are going to be on the panel, it looks exactly the same, except it's got a little bit more technology. And the, the, if you've seen it on television, this is a little bit higher. But since our chamber was built after ADA passed, we have little ramps on the side, and we could not build it the way the Senate could build it before that. Um, when Senator Kennedy had the vision for the Institute, he wanted it to be a place that would not only educate students and visitors about the important role of the United States Senate in our democracy, but that it would really inspire people to become more active citizens in all of their communities. Since opening our doors last March, we've strived to do just that, and hosting this evening's discussion is no exception. This discussion tonight is part of our Getting to the Point series. If you tried to get out to Columbia Point tonight through the, the wandering ways, you see we're making two points, that you have to decide to come out here. But then what you're going to hear in the conversations here will be people who are really getting to the point. Um, we bring together speakers with diverse perspectives to discuss current issues facing our government, our nation, and our communities. Uh, that's why we're so thrilled to have Congressman Moulton and our panelists with us here tonight, leaders in our government and our community who are coming together to give us a deeper understanding of an important issue facing both our local and global community, which is refugees. Congressman Moulton has committed both his life and career to public service. Since taking office just over a year ago, he has encouraged us with his determination to speak up on the issues that he believes in, while still being willing to work with his colleagues on the other side of the aisle to make progress in a strongly divided Congress. This is a way of governing that I think many of you know Senator Kennedy embraced and was well known for. And it's a message that we seek to impart to our students, to our visitors of all ages, and to future leaders who walk through our doors. Democracy, far from being easy, requires hard work. And an engaged generation of citizens who are willing to come together, bound by a common hope and optimism of what the world can be, to work toward a better future. So I want to thank all of this evening's panelists for joining us for this discussion. Phil Nadeau, as the Deputy City Administrator for Lewiston, Maine, has worked with local, state, and federal agencies to assist in the transition of more than 5,000 refugees into Lewiston in the past 15 years alone. And when you leave here, you might be in time to get to see Chronicle, where they're going to talk about Lewiston, Maine. We're delighted that you're here with us tonight. Eva Malona, as the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, has helped to promote the rights and integration of the more than one million immigrants and refugees from across the Commonwealth. Jessica Vaughn, Director of Policy Studies at the Center of Immigration Studies, leads the independent research organization to provide immigration policymakers in the academic community with reliable information about the impact of legal and illegal immigration into the United States. We are honored to have you all here with us tonight. I want to thank our friends at UMass Boston for collaborating with us on this important conversation. We are very fortunate to share a campus with a university that has a transform, been a transformative force in providing excellent, affordable education to the thousands of students that enroll in their school year. And we are looking forward to a follow-up discussion on this very same topic on Monday, April 11th, 
on the topic of the Syrian refugee crisis. We hope that you'll be interested in joining us. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you to Maria Sacchetti from the Boston Globe, Globe for moderating this evening's discussion. We are all better informed for the insight you give to your readers, and we are excited to have you lead this discussion. Finally, you might be wondering, why do I have this tablet on my table? Uh, you know, the Edward Kennedy Institute is a virtual museum, and our exhibits are projected on the wall, and you get to interact with them through your Google Pad, which you get when you come in. Um, I want you to invite you tonight to do something we do every day in a program we call Today's Vote. We put an issue in front of our senators for the day. We give a Republican and a Democratic point of view. We take actual legislation that is in front of the Senate at this time and we ask people to participate in the discussion and to vote. And you'll vote electronically, and you'll see your vote come up on the screen. So after we, at the conclusion of the panel discussion, we're asking our program participants to join us in voicing your opinion in voting on a piece of legislation that the US Congress is currently taking into consideration, Senator Ted Cruz's refugee bill. bill. And we will have our wonderful uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate join you and lead you through that activity. But to begin our discussions so that we'll make an informed vote, please join me in welcoming Congressman Seth Bolton, the Democrat from Massachusetts 6th Congressional District. Congressman Bolton. Thank you so much, Dr. McCormick. It's an honor to be here. So to you and all of your team at the Institute, thank you very much for having me this evening. It's a particular honor to be here in this chamber because, you know, as a member of the House of Representatives, we actually invite the Senate to come sit with us all the time. I mean, they were over there just a couple weeks ago for the State of the Union. We had them there for the Pope. But they never invite us to sit behind their desks in the Senate. So it's an honor to be here with all of you. Creating this institute for students and citizens to feel the power of the Senate chamber, to learn about and even participate in the ongoing public policy debates of our time is incredibly powerful. From the abolition of slavery, to giving women the right to vote, to our participation in world and regional wars, our nation's leaders over the last two centuries have debated those issues in the United States Senate chambers. One of those debates is the role of the United States in accepting refugees. Senator Kennedy himself was a champion of refugees. From as early as his first five years in office, when he was a champion of refugees fleeing the violence of the Vietnam War, to later refugee crises in Africa and other regions of the world. During his time in office, Senator Kennedy served as the original co-sponsor of over 70 refugee-related measures. In fact, his first piece of legislation that passed was the Seminole Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. This bill eliminated the antiquated 19th century quota system and instituted a migration system grounded in principles of equality and opportunity that led directly to the rich diversity of cultures, races, regions, and ethnicities that characterizes our country today. To me, the question about whether the United States should or should not accept Syrian and Iraqi refugees comes down to one thing, American values. We cannot as a country, espouse liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness, and then close our borders to those seeking refuge from persecution. Historically, the US has been a beacon of hope for those fleeing the world's most violent conflict zones. Yet, there are various points in our history when the hateful political rhetoric we are hearing today 
was a similarly powerful force on our land. For example, today's anti-refugee rhetoric is reminiscent of the 1930s when the U.S. initially refused Jewish refugees who were fleeing the Holocaust in Europe. In a Gallup poll conducted in 1939 before the U.S. entered the war and long before the war's end in 1945, 67% of Americans polled opposed taking refugees, taking in refugee children, in fact, fleeing Hitler's rule. Today we look back and consider this opposition to accepting refugee children fleeing the Holocaust as bigoted, fearful, and wrong. And the same will be true as we look back on some of the debates and decisions about accepting refugee children fleeing Syria and Iraq today. During and after World War II, the U.S. accepted 400,000 refugees. After the Vietnam War, the U.S. accepted over 720,000 refugees. From the for former Soviet Union, over 500,000, half a million. More recently, from the wars in Kosovo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, over 140,000. This fiscal year, we plan to accept a mere 10,000 Syrian refugees and a total from all nationalities in the world of just 85,000. Today, refugees undergo the highest level of security checks of any category of traveler to the U.S., including the involvement of the National Counterterrorism Center, the FBI's Terrorist Screening Center, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Departments of Defense and State. America is at its best when we lend a hand to those fleeing persecution. After all, many of these refugees are the victims of terrorism themselves. That's, that's why they're fleeing. Now, I was honored to bring a young Syrian refugee to the State of the Union as my guest this year. His name is Ahmed, nine years old, actually just turned 10. He's careful to remind me. Ahmed lost both of his arms, three of his brothers and sisters, and his grandparents in an airstrike on his refugee camp, his home at the time. Ahmed has gone through more tragedy in nine years than any of us can expect to go through in a lifetime. And yet it is incredible what a young leader this young man is. He came into my office and he said, we were talking for a little bit, and where he's going to school and what he likes to study. And he said, you know, Seth, I wanted to be sad, but it didn't make things better. I wanted to, make, I wanted to be angry, but it didn't make things better. So I just decided to be happy. And with that spirit, he wrote a letter to the President of the United States. And he said of his Syrian brothers and sisters back home, even if they haven't lost their arms, they've lost everything. And I asked Ahmed, what does he want to do in the U.S.? What does he want to be when he grows up? And he said, I want to be a doctor so that I can take care of people the way the doctors in Boston are taking care of me. Now, that sounds like the kind of person that we want in this country. That sounds to me like someone who believes in the American dream. Now, Carly Fiorina got on the Herald Radio and said that I shouldn't be taking someone like that to the State of the Union. So there's a fair debate out there from people with views that many Americans respect. But I'll tell you what, I tweeted a picture of Ahmed in D.C. in the Capitol, and I said, do you really want to deny the American dream to this young man? The silence was deafening. Shutting the door on Syrian refugees like Ahmed and his family, who are fleeing the very terrorists we're fighting, is inconsistent with our values, and it will not help us defeat our enemies. In fact, it is playing right into their hands. And that is why I voted against 
H.R. 4038, which would have effectively stopped the incoming flow of Syrian and Iraqi refugees. These people are hardworking, contributing members of our community who have come here seeking the American dreams, the very values that we represent. But this is also personal for me because, you know, a lot of the critics have said, okay, well, Seth, why don't you take in a refugee yourself? Well, in fact, my family has uh, an asylum seeker to be exact. Mohammed was one of my first translators in Iraq. Actually, my first translator was, uh, was Saddam Hussein. And I, um, I asked Saddam one day, I said, that's a tough, tough name, I said to this 19-year-old kid. And he said, well, Seth, it used to be very popular. But after Saddam Hussein, <laughs> I had Muhammad. And Muhammad had an interesting job with me because he was not only my translator, um, he was my translator at a time when I got put in charge of working with the Iraqi media. And through a long story uh, that I won't bore you with right now, Muhammad and I came to host a TV show. And so Muhammad and I were TV personalities in Iraq. We had to sign autographs in the street. No one asked me to sign autographs around here. But at the time, this was a big deal in Iraq. The standards for TV were very low. <laughs> Muhammad was therefore a translator who not only put his life on the line for his country, but for ours. And he did it in a very public way. Now, I'd like to say that I helped Muhammad come to America. The truth is he got himself here on his own through a Fulbright scholarship. He came here to study to get his master's degree with the full intention of going back. He wanted to become a professor at the University of Baghdad where he had gone to school himself. Unfortunately, when he was here, the Iraq war worsened and it turned into a civil war. And at that time, it would have been a death sentence for him to go back. In fact, his family had to pick up them, themselves and move to a different city because they were targeted by the insurgents because of Muhammad's work with us, Muhammad's work with me. And so through the help of some other Bostonians, including some lawyers downtown, I helped Muhammad seek asylum in America. But in the course of that process, he needed a place to live because you can't just say, oh, I want asylum and have a great job you need a family to take you in, and that's what my family did. So in 2007, when I deployed to Iraq for my fourth tour, Muhammad moved in to my old house in Marblehead, and he became a fixture of the community, someone a lot better known in that small town than I ever was. Muhammad also exemplifies the American dream, and it's why this is a personal issue for me. So I will work tirelessly to ensure that our country remains a source of hope for those who seek refuge from the world's most violent conflicts. And as you join in this debate, in this discussion tonight, I hope you too will consider not just the challenges of the day, but the values, the timeless values for which we stand as Americans. It's an honor to be here tonight. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate about American democracy. Thank you. I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, um, thanks everybody for being here, and um, thanks to the Kennedy Institute for um, asking Globe to participate. We appreciate it very much, and thanks, of course, to all the panelists for for being here. It's um, it's great to have a conversation with different views and to be able to to have that, even though we, we don't always see it in the in, you know a civil conversation. Have that in the in the um, in this venue. So. 
I thought we would start with Phil um, and your experience in Lewiston. Um, in 2001, this is when all of this began for you, right? Can, can you tell us about what it was like, what the climate was like then, and, um, and how, how the city experiences change, how the refugees experiences change in Lewiston? Right, well this, uh, for, the, for the benefit of people that don't know the story, this is the uh, condensed version of, of that experience, but in, sh in short, it started with uh, the refugee resettlement program in Portland, Maine. Uh, Portland's been a resettlement community uh, for 25, 30 years. Uh, and it's a wonderful city. I, none of you have ever uh, visited Maine or Portland. Uh, it's a wonderful city. It's about 60,000 people. Uh, wonderful resources, uh, harbor. It's a, you know, it's the kind of place that lots of people would live, you know, love to live in and developed a reputation among the populations that moved there. Uh, and the word gets out. You know, people, people like to communicate good news, and uh, the people that were resettled there, um, you know, it's a very, very diverse group of, of refugees that had been resettled there over the course of the years, including Somalis. Uh, by the year 2000, the vacancy rates in Portland uh, were so low that it was very, very difficult to find housing. Um, the Portland Social Services Department uh, gave it their best effort, but they were, over time, there were progressively more families that were arriving, and not through resettlement, through secondary migration. The, you know, the business of having um, a refugee who's been resettled in another community picking up and leaving, contrary to what a lot of people think, once refugees arrive in this country, you know, they're free to move about as they please. They don't have to register in when they move to another community, like none of us have to register. So they have the, uh, the luxury of making those decisions on their own. And there were a number of secondary migrants that were, that were Somali that were moving into Portland. You don't prepare for that. It just happens. And if you don't have the resources to be able to support it, you've got to do the next best thing. So Portland called us and said, can you move a few families? In short, that decision to move, I think, four families initially in February of 2001 started this relocation, the act of simply moving a handful of families in February of 2001. Uh, within about four months, uh, maybe 100, 150 or so individuals lived in the community, most of them through, these, through this agreement that we have with the city of Portland. And then suddenly, one day, Somebody comes into the office who wasn't sent by the city of Portland. They come off a Greyhound bus from DeKalb County, Georgia, where most of the secondaries were coming from at that point, and then began um, the process of having people moving directly from DeKalb County to Lewiston because the word got out. Nice town, great facilities, the school department, health care, uh, very, very affordable. Uh, and the numbers suddenly began to grow. And this was all unprogrammed relocation. Uh, Lewiston is uh, completely unprepared for what then begins to be a, a, a growing number of people. And we're doing the best we can to try to keep up and, and just learn who, who these people are. And, and you know, for the most part, I, I've shared with people before that for most of us, uh, at least speaking for those of us in Lewiston, I won't speak for you, but certainly for us. Uh, when the Somalis started arriving in town, the only thing we really knew about, you know, about this group of people was what we saw in, in the movie Black Hawk Down. That was it. That was the most recent reference point that we had, what had occurred in Black Hawk Down. And, and the irony of Black Hawk Down uh, is that um, along with that that, that, that experience, the 19 military personnel that were killed in that action, one of those personnel came from Lisbon, Maine. It was an adjoining town to Lewiston, Maine. Uh, Staff Sergeant Tom Fields uh, died in action in, in Mogadishu. Um, not that everyone thought or made that connection, but that connection was made. Uh, and it was brought up to me more than once about who they were, the suspicions that they had, why were they leaving Somalia and moving here if they would do that kind of thing to US military? And I think Congress Moulton just made reference to the fact, you know, like the Syrians, the people that were 
escaping Somalia, we're escaping that kind of, of, of civil war, uh, were not the people that were responsible uh, for killing Sergeant Fields and the other 18 military personnel. Uh, but you know, having gone through that experience, I understand the emotion. Uh, you don't have to agree with it, but it's important that you understand it because it's out there. Uh, and you have to address it, and you can't just ignore it. Um, so we had to get through that period of time. So between February of 2001 and August of 2002, uh, we estimated that roughly 1,000 people had relocated to the city, a, a city that was working on do doing whatever it could to try to be as prepared as we could. We didn't have the benefit of refugee resettlement agency in town. We just had the benefit of a lot of people that wanted to work on the issue. And so, uh, I'm sorry, so, yes. so during that time period, also you had 9-11 um, happen, right? And then you, you also, so and most of these folks coming to town were, were also Muslim, right? Yes, they were, they were so predominantly Muslim. How, how did, in that time, was there a lot of fear, and did anyone call for a halt to the refugees? No, but as, as you might imagine, following 9-11, um, you, you know, this, this, the, the, it's, it's in the discussion. Uh, the concerns about you know what happens if one of them slips through, what would they do to us? Those those kinds of things. It's clearly uh, you know on, on some people's minds, but it never stops the process. And and I just don't get the sense that even though those kinds of concerns were out there, you know regarding you know people of the Islamic faith. I mean it it just it just it didn't seem to rise to the same level of discourse that, that's going on today. Uh, this is even, you know, and, and it certainly began to, to decline as, as, our, as this experience of ours went through. If any of you know the story, the mayor wrote a letter, asked people from the Somali community to share with their friends and family, please don't come. We're, you know, we don't have enough resources to handle the people that we have now. That was the source of lots of national discussion, international discussion. Brought, to, brought a white um, supremacist group to town for a membership meeting. That turned into a rally of about 4,000 people that uh, was assembled for, in January of 2003. It was a wonderful event for the city, a wonderful event for the state, a wonderful statement about uh, people coming together and defending the rights of people to live and you know, be free and to enjoy their lives, uh, and, a, and, and a transformative moment for our community with, that a actually served as the foundation for where we are today and all of the good work that's going on in the city today. And that is truly the condensed version of that story, by the way. It's certainly and a lot how, of I'm so fascinated story. by this. And how, how has it worked out? How has it worked? I mean, are, have people integrated, or is there still this? Well, I mean, you know, change is hard. In, in, in any community, change is hard, and particularly if you're a community. Yes, Maine at that time had the distinction of being the widest state in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's get that off the table right now. But um, uh, I, I think the curiosity because of that, you know, it's that combination of we're the widest state in the country. Yeah, it's really cold in Maine. Yes, it does snow. No bears don't walk in the middle of Main Street. You know, it's, you know we, we're actually a small city and, you know, with small kinds of things that you find in small towns, you know, uh, less the bears walking through Main Street. And, um, it, it, you know, the, the, the entire experience turns out to be a good experience, if not but for the fact that you have a community that recognized, and Lewiston is not a very wealthy community. It's, you know, the 10 largest cities in Maine. It's the least wealthy of the 10 largest cities in Maine. But what we have is we have tremendous social capital, wonderful uh, you know, commitment to volunteerism, partnerships, non-traditional and traditional. They're all over the place. And it's really what has made the difference. A community that is wholly and totally committed to the idea of making it work uh, across organizations, across faiths. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful experience to see and to experience. And don't leave, I don't want to leave you with the impression that this is easy, it's not. That we have our share of people you know, that, that don't embrace the idea, um, uh, that have concerns to this day about security and all those other things, but it didn't stop the good work uh, of, of being done. Uh, it still goes on today. It's, that work is not above the fold. Uh, in, and, and most often is not, uh, but it, if, if not but for that work, uh, we would not be in the position that we are today uh, and, and experiencing you know, the, the joys of being a more diverse community with, with something like 30 or 35 countries represented in our population today. It's a much more diverse population than just Somali today. Uh, and I will add that it's the, the relocations continue today, but it's a totally different group of people. It's predominantly asylum seekers. 
that are coming to our community today, a very, very different group from a very different part of Africa, uh, predominantly African. And uh, it's a, a very interesting story uh, in and of itself and how that shifted over the last few years. Uh, but, uh, but the work continues. Yeah, and I, I thought that was interesting, kind of did the different points about how population had been declining. But like in Massachusetts, I mean, we've read the population increases partly because of immigrants, and, and these are um, also ways businesses grow, and, and there are certainly challenges that come with that as well. Um, not to mention the championship soccer team. I promised I would mention them, so that's, that's also that's very a, interesting. That was certainly <laughs> a wonderful thing to happen. Um, Eva, so uh, moving to Eva, um, I wanted to ask, um, why, what, what are the legal reasons we take refugees? Like, why, why are we even having this debate? I mean, legally, why? Do we, do we have to take refugees, or what, what, is, what is happening? So thank you, Maria, for the question. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. And I only, only to thank Dr. McCormick for the invitation, but also each and every one of you for your presence tonight. Thank you so much. So by way of history, it wasn't until uh, after World War II that the United States began to differentiate the term refugee from the term immigrant and began creating a policy that specifically dealt with refugees and speaking outside of the immigration policy. Um, at the wake of World War II, um, over 250,000 Europeans were displaced, um, and those were the first refugees that came to the US. And it was at that time that the Congress, for the first time, um, enacted the Displacement Person Act of 1948, which is the first piece of legislation that dealt with displacement. And there was an additional of 400,000 refugees um, that entered at that, at that time. Later, there were other laws uh, that were passed that um, helped the admission of uh, refugees that came from communist regime, from Eastern Europe, from Hungary and Poland and former Yugoslavia, but also from Korea and China and, and uh, Cuba. But most of these waves of refugees were assisted by um, ethnic and religious organizations. So it wasn't a comprehensive way of regulating uh, the refugee flows and regulating the refugee policy. Uh, the first act, the first most comprehensive act that, um, that um, gives, incorporated all the laws for the admission and regulation of refugees was the Refugee Act of 1980 that Senator Kennedy wrote and was the champion of making it happen. The hearing um, at the time started between you know, 65 and 75 in the border security and in the Judiciary Committee, but there wasn't that much support. Um, there was, you know, fear as to how this will play out in our economy, in our country. Um, but the senator fought hard, and he was the champion, and he made it happen. And finally, under President Carter, that was signed into law, and that's the first comprehensive um, act. And um, the Refugee Act provides really the legal basis of today's refugees' admission, that it, it's administered by the Bureau of Populations, uh, Refugees and Migration, and the Department of State in conjunction with the Office of Refugee Resettlement and the Department of Health and Human Services. And based on that law, every year the president, in consultation with Congress, sets the ceilings as how many refugees can enter um, in the United States. And since 1975, on that legal basis, we have received uh, about 3 million refugees. And uh, proud to say that we as a country have one of the best models of integration. And they have done, you know, they're part of the fabric. And uh, they really set us up as a country that really have a remarkable history of building a nation of immigrants and welcoming refugees. So we had a, um, a comment, a question from the audience. Uh, Lola, Lola Hiller, Hiller Stillman, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Good question. Um, but if you could please explain the vetting process for refugees from Syria and, and I guess Iraq as well. But um, if you, and, I, and I wonder if it's the same for all refugees, actually. Well, there is, I mean, this has been the question of the day that, you know, is it safe and how's the process of refugees and then attempt that we see all in Congress to really add layers of security. Um, and I don't want to bore you, but I very briefly will 
uh, go over the steps, um, the security screening for refugees that are admitted to the United States, and it's a very comprehensive, detailed, and rigorous process. So step, step number one is, in most cases, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees determines that the individuals qualify for a refugee status under the international, international law. And uh, a refugee is someone who has fled his or her home country, demonstrate fear, um, a well-founded fear, if they were to return, based, they will be prosecuted based on five internationally recognized grounds uh, that include religion, nationality, race, political opinion and affiliation in a specific group. So first, the first step is getting um, the referral that the person meets the definition. Step number two is a referral to the United States. A refugee that meets the criteria for resettlement is referred to a US government or a US embassy or a trained uh, non-government organization. Step number three, a resettlement support center contracted by the US Department of State complies the refugee personal data, background information for security clearance, and present that to the Department of Homeland Security for an in-person interview. Step number four, there is security clearance process with information collected from the RSC centers and a number of security checks are also conducted very carefully. The Department of State runs the names of the refugees referred to the United States for resettlement and send the standards called CLASP that stands for Consular Lookout and Support System name check. In addition, Enhanced interagency security checks were phased in the beginning of 2008 that apply to all refugees applicants by 2010. Step number five, security clearance process. Certain refugees undergo an additional security review called security advisory opinion from certain countries that um, are required to go through specific additional uh, security check. And then when those, when those checks are run, uh, then the person can go to step number six, which is another security clearance process. Refugees who meet the minimum age requirement have their fingerprint taken, they're photographed, um, and they, all of these security checks are done, but very, uh, by trained employees, uh, from specific um, departments, the U.S. government that deal with the databases and all the information to make sure that those security checks conducted matching with what information is in the database. Step number seven, it's also in-person interview. And all applicants who have gone through the six steps will be interviewed in person by qualified very well trained U.S. asylum officers or uh, refugee um, asylum officers. And that in-person interview gave them the chance not only to match what it is, but hear the well-founded fear of the individual being interviewed. Step number eight, there is the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security approval. In the U.S., um, the specialized uh, USCIS officer find that individuals qualify for the refugee status, they meet um, the definition, they have gone through the security checks, and they are conditionally approved for admission. Then it's step number nine, after they go through medical screening and all of that, and there are also additional steps to matching the refugees with agencies and the cultural orientation and also health screening. But the seven steps that I mentioned are really, as you can tell, really 
carefully layered in a very comprehensive way to make sure there's a match of those who come that they are who are they think who they are. Wow. And as it sounds, it can take two years, right? I mean, it does sound like a pretty long sometimes process. Sometimes a long sometimes, time, yeah. and after 9/11, because of the long process and making sure that the you know the, the database and other systems in place were giving them a chance to um, to the screening to be done in more detail, and they took more time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for laying that out. And so, so basically, these are people who fear for their lives and who are. And I, I'm interested. These are here. victims. I mean, you heard the congressman. I mean, these are victims who are fleeing for their lives, and they've been in refugee camps, and they're going through all this process. So why make it more difficult for them and add other layers, and another length of time where you know the trauma and what they have been through, right. I think has been enough. Yeah. for a long time. And, and, that, and that, but then there's, there's also the flip side, which is there's um, questions about, we, we know that some people have beaten this process, right? So we, saw, we saw the, had the case um, in New England of a woman from Rwanda, Rwanda who was recently prosecuted because uh, she said she was a victim of the genocide. And in fact, um, prosecutors later found out that she had helped perpetrate that. And there's been other people who have kind of, there, there seem to be holes in the system. Jessica, I think you were going to raise. I mean, are, are there holes in the system? It does seem very thorough. There are many steps. Um, there's a lot of vetting that goes on, um, but, but do you think there are still too many holes in this vetting system? <clears throat> yes, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, yes, and in fact, um, the concerns about the adequacy of the vetting process and the risks associated with taking in refugees from certain parts of the world are, is the most frequently raised concern. In, especially in terms of the Syrian refugees. And, you know, as someone who has actually participated um, in the vetting of immigrants um, for a time in my career as a foreign service officer with the State Department, I can tell you that there are very real limitations to the vetting that can be done. Um, Eva outlined um, a step-by-step -step process, but it's important to understand some other parts of that. First of all, it's um, the UN uh, organization, UNHCR, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, um, is the organization that determines, that essentially selects refugees and determines if they qualify. And they use their local employees in the regions from which, uh, near where people have been dis displaced. And again, they, you know, they're dealing with people who have, um, you know, faced very uh, difficult circumstances, and their job is to try to help them get to a safe place. Their job really is not to worry about what happens if they were to be relocated to the United States or a European country or whatever. In other words, they're not, their prime concern is not the security risks that may be associated with people. In and then uh, the, the UN organizations are the ones that decide which of the refugees that have been identified will be settled in the United States, and they refer those individuals to the US. For our part, we can only screen people um, against the databases that contain the names of known or suspected terrorists, and, and I emphasize the word known. We simply don't have a lot of information about uh, people in Syria, we don't have uh, government agencies that we can work with in Syria. We don't have people on the ground there who can do investigations. We don't even know if the documents that people have provided to the UN are, belong to those people or if they've been printed by ISIS, which has its own passport printing presses and the ability to make documents for anybody who's willing to pay for them. So essentially, it, it's pretty much an honor system. Um, we usually have to accept what the UN has told us about these individuals and have very little ability to know what their intentions are. And, and of course, we know that ISIS has, has told us that it would like to send people to infiltrate the refugee flow. So the process takes a long time, but it's not uh, as if you know, the entire 18 to 24 month period that people have to wait for their approval is spent checking people out. It, the reason it takes so long is because 
the State Department and USCIS have a huge number of people to try to assess and vet. And they have a limited amount of time in which to do that. And we take fingerprints, but we have nothing to match those fingerprints against in most cases. And, and that's one of the reasons why terrorists have already been able to infiltrate our refugee flow. Um, we offered refugee status to a couple of uh, guys from Iraq who turned out to have uh, attacked U.S. soldiers in Iraq and were planning a similar attack on U.S. soldiers here in the United States. In fact, since 2014, there have been 14 instances of people who were admitted as refugees or as the children of refugees who've been arrested for being involved in terrorism or associated with a terrorist group. So our vetting system is most definitely fallible. Um, there's always a risk uh, in admitting anyone. I mean, until we have a machine that can read someone's mind, we're never going to know if someone is you know, like really a terrorist or intends to harm people or is lying or whatever reason they are trying to come to the United States. But what we have to do as a country is try to minimize that risk. And that's why FBI Director uh, Jim Comey has, has advised Congress against admitting a large number of Syrian refugees because he said, you know, you can check databases, these are his words, until the cows come home, but we have nothing to check it against. We simply have no confidence that the people we're admitting from certain parts of the world, especially Syria, are who they say they are. And so that's one of the, the big problems. I think that's why there is um, a lot of hesitation about really increasing the number of Syrian refugees that we're admitting. But Jessica, so. do, you, do you think the answer is really cutting them off? I mean, we could all see, I mean, even, even in the past few weeks, children on boats, you know, drowning still, that they're still taking this risk, you know, from Turkey to, to cross the Aegean to the Greek islands. Um, you know, of course, Ahmed, he's an example of someone who lost his. I mean, the United States has called for, you know, the president of Syria to resign. You know, we're, we're, we've taken a pretty strong stand against him. And, um, and, uh, and, and as a result, the reports are that, um, that he's raining bombs full of oil, you know, on, on, on his own people. And this is how so many people are, are running away. And, um, and so, I, so these are people who, who say they really are in, in fear for their lives. So, I mean, is the answer really to stop you know, taking care of them, stop welcoming them to the country? No, I don't, I don't think that would be an answer that most Americans would want to give. I think uh, all of us recognize that there are uh, many people who've been displaced in terrible circumstances, not only in Syria, but in other parts of the world, and we want to be able to help them. Uh, I th the answer really is to be more careful in who we select to come here as refugees. And I think also considering the great cost to the communities that are absorbing the refugees once they get here, uh, we have to consider the impact on the U.S. communities as well. And um, we did an analysis of these costs and found that the five-year cost of admitting a refugee from Syria is $64,000 for the various um, support and services that they receive and need when they arrive, and yet that's 12 times the cost of what it is to support a refugee in, in the region where they are, in, in, whether living in the economy as most of them are in Jordan and Turkey and Lebanon. And so we could actually help 12 more people by putting those funds into assisting the UN in their efforts and in the other countries that have been so generous in absorbing all of the people displaced from Syria. And so I think it actually makes more sense to try to help more people with the same amount of money than try to pluck people out of Syria, except for the few cases that are really appropriate for resettlement. But you know, I, I think the, the debate now is really over how many, not should we take any. Great. Well, that actually um, leads to an um, interesting question from a couple of interesting questions from the audience. Um, this is John from Massachusetts. Um, and I, it just seems like it's worth uh, reiterating. Um, under international law, does the United States have to accept refugees? Or can we just say no? We have the refugee law. I mean, we have been accepting refugees, and we passed a whole comprehensive law to accept refugees and to regulate refugee policy. And I also wanted to highlight the fact that 
We have a successful history of resettlement. Since 1975, three million people have been resettled from different cultures and different nationalities and different religions. And only three arrests, only three arrests have been made based on terrorist, attack, uh, terrorist uh, charges and the plots weren't that harmful. So the history speaks, the evidence speaks for itself that do, we do have um, a comprehensive vetted system, and we have addressed in a remarkable way uh, the security. So, in our view, is you know expediting the process and going through those steps in a timely manner. I think it helps security. Oh. And you, do you differ with that, or? Yeah, actually, the Senate Judiciary Committee found identified 14 cases of people admitted as refugees or the children of refugees who've been uh, arrested for terrorism or association with the terrorist group just since 2014. So, uh -huh. okay. So, all right. um, so uh, another question on uh, funding for integration um, from Julie from Riviera. Thank you, Julie. Um, so has funding for integration been an issue? Uh, Phil, I wonder if you might answer that question. <laughs> well, I've written, on, I've written about um, the funding process uh, for uh, refugee resettlement, um, specifically um, around the issue of employment, um, and we were talking about it in the, uh, in the uh, green room before we walked out here. Uh, when Senator Kennedy sponsored uh, the 1980 Refugee Resettlement Act, it was a very different time, uh, and um, the composition of, of refugees that were coming into the United States was, was quite different. I mean, uh, I read something in the order of about 11 countries uh, represented the refugee populations that were moving into the United States around 1980. Today, I believe in the last fiscal year, the data shows it was 66 different countries. Uh, and I think it's something in the order of 115 or 20 different languages uh, that, that, that those people represented. Um, with, and, and, and the issue is the complexity that's associated with working with these groups, um, the process of getting them acclimated to the community, uh, to, to uh, finding a job. Uh, and uh, the Somali population it represents um, one of the 10 largest groups of refugees uh, that um, uh, have been brought into the United States. And one of, the f one of the issues that we're confronted with in our community is that the rates of illiteracy and low levels of literacy, native language literacy, uh, was quite high. And that posed some pretty significant challenges relative to job training and, and workforce uh, preparedness. Uh, and that goes on today, uh, and and that's it's, it's being experienced by communities that have uh, Burmese populations in them, uh, uh, um, and 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 several other populations as well. Uh, th the business of getting them to work is important because the core mission of the ORR is is economic self-sufficiency, and if you have to expend you know a, a significant resources to prepare them to be productive and to be able to uh, participate in the economy, your local economy, uh, and you don't have the resources to do it, and we are woefully short, and we don't have enough time to talk about it tonight, but just consider this. In 2005, the Target Assistance Program, which is the backbone of the, of the workforce investment, uh, the job training part of the ORR, was $49 million. Today, it's $47 million. Uh, the, the, the number of dollars that are being invested in workforce training are only, are only focused on the first five years of resettlement. Uh, it's a high-speed process to try to get them into the economy with any kind of job and no, really very little consideration for how that will prepare them long term, particularly, and I'm talking about populations like the population that we have in our community, uh, and, or to prepare them at all. The amount of ESL training that they would need uh, uh, would far exceed anything that's even available in the Workforce Investment Act. So we need to do a better job, I think, as a country to prepare populations like those uh, to be able to assist communities to get them into the workplace. And like I said, we could talk about this for a long time and we simply don't have the time. So just on that one issue alone, I would say the program is, is, is um, it, quite deficient. Great. Well, thank you. Um, here's another question from um, Mahdi Ali from Boston. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. Um, the United States is um, one, you know, one of the first to respond to refugees all over the world, but what capacity does New England have to participate in these refugee programs? I wonder if um, 
it sounds like um, there's been a lot of debate in New England over who should take refugees. I mean, is there a certain percentage allotted to Massachusetts, or how, how do we participate in that? Well, we receive, Massachusetts receives between 22 to 2,400 refugees every year from different parts of the world. And proud to say that the state of Massachusetts, in terms of the self-sufficiency, it's number two in the country. So people very quickly become part of the workforce and go through the training and, and you know, become contributors to uh, our economy. Uh, but this is not you know, a large number, 2,400 people a year. Uh, being spread, you know, uh, across the Commonwealth. I don't think that's an issue of capacity, and especially, you know, given the fact that they're very quickly become part of the workforce. I think the facts speak for themselves. And, and I would only add to that 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 you spoke exactly to to the issue. It's a, it's a it's a issue of capacity. You know, if you're, you know, in a state like Maine, which is not a very wealthy state, in a community like Lewiston, which is the least wealthy of the ten largest cities in Maine. Uh, we, we simply don't have that, the resources and the wealth that, that, that uh, many communities have. And without that resource, um, we have lots of human capital and a lot of people that have done some extraordinary work. And if not but for that work, uh, we wouldn't have the results that we have today. But we know we could do better if those results, if, if those resources would have been there. And we know we could do more today if those resources would be available. So um, it's just a lost opportunity, in my, my opinion. Um, many things you said that I thought were so interesting is um, just, if, yeah, we could just, yeah. if we could just get more resources for uh, English as a second language training, workforce development training around ESL uh, for employers. I mean, what Australia does uh, is is part of a national labor strategy when they bring refugees into that into that uh, country. Uh, within three months, uh, they're given an opportunity to sign up for you know, you know, ESL training. It's part of their workforce development strategy. It's handled through the agencies that handle employment, not through hand, that, that handle refugee resettlement. That's a national commitment to, to do that kind of thing. We, we don't have that kind of connection between refugee resettlement and employment training in this country. It's the c communities are left to try to assemble these pools of money to try to assemble a local strategy. And like I said, if you have a lot of resources locally or at a state to do that, you're, you're fortunate. In a state like Maine, uh, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, we simply don't have the capacity. One very quick point on the capacity issue. Massachusetts, so the budget of the state of Massachusetts for refugees that goes to the um, Massachusetts Office for Immigrants and Refugees, which is under the department, uh, under HHS, it's less than a million dollars because the $21 million do come from ORR, from you know, federal dollars that come to the state of Massachusetts. So the state investment, it's very, very little. So very little money goes to the Office of Refugee Resettlement for uh, refugee services. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. I agree. I think we should be proud in the Commonwealth for our success in integration of refugees. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fine quality of the organizations that are providing those services in our state. Lucky to have them. They're an asset to our state. Um, but the issue of resources is an important one. And that's why I think one real improvement that could be made to our system would be to give the com receiving communities more of a voice in the process. Because right now, what happens is the group of resettlement contractors meets in a suburb of Washington and decides where refugees are going to be placed. And the receiving communities really receive very little consultation on that. And yet, they're the ones that are taking on the task of supporting them in the community and, and helping them succeed. And so, um, the distribution of refugees has not been even across the Commonwealth even. I, I mean, there are certain communities like Lynn and Springfield that have taken a disproportionate share. 25% of the refugees who've been resettled in Massachusetts are in the city of Lynn. And I think we need to look at the, the system and try to find a way that would um, spread out that task across the Commonwealth a little bit more evenly um, because we are starting to see some concerns within the prime resettlement communities about the fairness of them taking on the cost of this. So, great. 
Well, thank you all. That's, that's great. It seems like we're just about out of time. And thank you all for your answers and for shedding light on this really important subject going forward. Thank you. Um, should we open it up to questions, or do are we? I think we're going to move on. go to the vote. Oh, great. So if Nate is here, yeah. he's going to come and lead the. Great. Well, as a reporter, I, I, I get to say neutral, so good luck to you all. <laughs> it's very nice to, to listen, so thank you. So why don't you come back to your seat so you can participate. In just a minute, we'll begin today's vote uh, on Bill S-2302 uh, in regards to Syrian repatriation uh, after my colleagues get here in just one minute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're about to begin our 30-minute program, today's vote. If uh, you're planning to go home now, once again, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, feel free to make your way out of the chamber. If you're planning to stay, uh, sit with a tablet on your desk, and we'll get you set up in just a moment. Today's vote is a program uh, we do every day that we're open at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, usually about three times a day, and we take a new topic each month. But this is the first time that we've done today's vote after one of our Getting to the Point panel discussions, and one of the first times we've done it on this scale with this many people in the chamber. Uh, so we appreciate you joining us and bearing with us, and we'd love to hear how, you, uh, how the experience was for you, and we'll have comment cards that you can fill out and drop off at the end of the program, and we would really like to hear your feedback. Additionally, when you leave, uh, there should be uh, some coupons as well, because uh, we'd love to have you back. We're getting you into the program just right now, and we'll ask folk with tablets to move to exhibit number 14 on the tablet. Members of our staff are coming around. Oh, yeah. Cool. If you want to hold, we're moving to today's vote on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, when you get to the blue screen, you will most likely be greeted with a discouraging sentence that says voting is done for the day. And that is simply because the institute is closed, but voting itself is not done. So don't be frightened. We'll be beginning in just a moment. In the meantime, while we're getting everyone set up, uh, we want to, again, uh, reiterate that this is a full-scale recreation of the Senate chamber in Washington, D.C. This is the same height, depth, and width of the Senate chamber since 1859. Generally, the rostrum uh, is attended by the journal clerk and the parliamentarian and the legislative clerk and the assistant secretary, but we're going to have some of our senators up here today uh, just because it presents a convenient stage. Is everyone intending to debate and vote through the tablet at the blue screen with the white lettering on it? Is there anyone else who requires assistance getting to the blue screen? Excellent. We'll start today's vote with a brief introductory video. Welcome 
to the Senate chamber at the Edward F. Kennedy Institute. This room is a full-scale recreation of the chamber in the U.S. Capitol in Washington. The Senate chamber has been the venue for key moments in American history and democracy, including the passage of landmark bills into law, momentous civil rights debates, and decisions on matters of war and peace. Today, as senators in training, this is your chamber, and you can experience the lawmaking process for yourself. You will have the chance to speak your mind and cast your vote on a bill actively under consideration by Congress. Good luck. Senate will come to order. In just a few moments, we're going to debate and weigh in on one of the issues that we have on display this month at our exhibits, immigration and national security. Since March of 2011, the nation of Syria has been engaged in a civil war between the forces of President Bashar al-Assad, those in opposition to President Assad, and the terrorist organization known as ISIS, the Islamic State, or ISIL. This conflict has claimed over a quarter million lives thus far and forced over four and a half million others to flee to other countries in search of protection. In response to this crisis, countries around the world have pledged to accept varying numbers of refugees. The United States, uh, which has taken in approximately 2,600 Syrians since the conflict began, has come under increasing criticism from human rights groups who are urging the government to do more to bring in more refugees. In response to this growing crisis and criticism, in September of 2015, the Obama administration announced that it would accept at least 10,000 refugees from Syria and increase the annual cap on all refugee visas to the United States from 70,000 per year to 100,000 per year by 2017. While many in the United States wish to provide refuge to those seeking conflict in the Middle East, many are also concerned that those seeking to harm the United States may attempt to enter the country as refugees in order to carry out terrorist attacks on American soil. This concern has generated a number of bills in Congress designed to either tighten screening measures for refugees or restrict admission of refugees from certain countries almost entirely. One such bill is Bill S-2302, the Terrorist Refugee Infiltration Prevention Act. So this is a real bill that was introduced on November 18th of 2015 and sent to the Committee on the Judiciary. We don't know what its ultimate fate will be, but today we're going to treat it as if it's been reported out of the Committee into the Chamber for final action. We're going to hear prepared statements, and then we're going to open up the floor to you, our visiting senators in training, to make statements for, against, or simply in reaction to the bill. But before we do that, I'd like to summarize the bill's provisions, what it would do if it became law. S-2302 prohibits the admission of any person to the United States who is a national of, has habitually resided in, or is claiming refugee status due to recent events in any country containing terrorist-controlled territory, defined in the bill as Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. However, a person may be admitted to the United States if they meet the following conditions. They satisfy the requirements for admission as a refugee under United States law, they are a victim of genocide, as defined by the United Nations and designated as such by the Secretary of State or an act of Congress, or they face immediate danger due to assistance they have provided to the U.S. government in the past. They, have also, uh, they are also to undergo security screenings that include assessment by the FBI, the Director of National Intelligence, and the Departments of State, Defense, and Homeland Security, as well as providing biometric information such as photos, eye scans, and fingerprints. Furthermore, the Secretary of State would be able to designate and add more countries to the list of those containing terrorist-controlled territory, as well as add more groups to the list of those considered to be victims of genocide. These lists must be made available to Congress and the public. The provisions in this bill would be effective for three years, beginning from its enactment. And that is a lot to throw at visiting senators in training. But I'm going to throw four more things at you. Uh, there are so always a number of factors that a senator has to consider and sometimes reconcile when they decide how they're going to act on a piece of legislation. And as senators now in this program, the four factors I would like you to consider are the interests of your political party, your state, the nation as a whole, and your own beliefs. 
You will, of course, senators, feel obliged to represent the interests of your party. They were instrumental to getting you elected. However, the people who did the actual electing, of course, are the people of your state. That's your most basic constituency. And yet you're not sitting in a state legislature. You're in the United States Senate, and your coworkers are from all over the country, and you're crafting legislation that, if passed, will affect the entire country, so you have to keep the interests of, your, of the nation right up with the interests of your state. And then there are your own beliefs. Senators may hold that they owe their constituents and their party and the nation not just a parroting of the majority opinion and not just representation, but their own individual judgment as well. We're about to open the floor for prepared statements on Bill S-2302. Mr. President, seek the floor. The chair recognizes the senator from Texas. Mr. President, we are at war. It has been declared by an enemy that not only prays for our destruction, but believes it has the means to act upon those prayers. An enemy committed to using the most appalling and barbaric methods towards its goals. And we can safely assume that they plan to attack us by any means necessary. This includes exploiting the beleaguered refugees fleeing conflict regions where ISIS continues to wreak havoc. Bill S-2302 accepts certain realities that are not comfortable to face, but are impossible to avoid. It is desirable and noble to help refugees fleeing these war-torn countries, but to do so without being able to thoroughly vet them is negligent and dangerous. It creates an avenue to attack this country that ISIS is sure to exploit. Currently, President Obama wants to commit to accepting tens of thousands of refugees from Syria. What guarantees do we have that there will not be an ISIS operative among them? The director of the FBI himself has said it would be impossible to run adequate background checks on these refugees because there is simply no way to access those records. Now, there are those who want to paint this legislation as biased, bigoted, or even racist. I reject these characterizations. This bill targets countries experiencing the ravages of radical Islamic terrorism because that is simply where the threat is coming from. Even if political correctness prevents one from using the term radical Islamic terrorism, the truth of the matter will not go away. Furthermore, this bill does not shut out all refugees fleeing from these war-torn countries. There are exceptions, compassionate exceptions, to include persecuted minorities like the Yazidis and Christian sects who face certain genocide at the hands of ISIS. There are also exceptions for people in these regions who are in extreme danger because they help U.S. security forces in the past. The governors of 31 states have declared their opposition to the repatriation of Syrian refugees. Now, while governors have no legal authority to prevent refugees from coming into their states, they are well within their rights to withhold resources that will be needed to successfully repatriate these people. Recent polling suggests that the majority of American citizens currently oppose accepting refugees from Syria as well. If we bring these refugees to the United States, what kind of welcome can they hope to receive? The carnage in Iraq and Syria threatens to spill onto, the so onto U.S. soil if we act with reckless abandon, no matter how good our intentions may be. I urge the Senate to pass this bill in the name of all Americans who have already died at the hands of ISIS and our constituents who look to us for guidance and protection. Thank you, Mr. President. Now yield the floor. Chamber may react as it sees fit. Mr. President, I seek the floor. Chair recognizes the senator from Vermont. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we have heard rhetoric in response to the Syrian refugee crisis that is dangerous, misleading, and downright un-American. The rhetoric demonizes victims of terrorism and torture who are seeking a safe haven. It twists the desperate plights of refugees into talking points for cable news and talk radio. It seeks for personal uh, political gain to frighten and divide Americans. We in this chamber should rise above it. America is better than this. The Senate is better than this. We can and should debate how many refugees to receive 
and how best to settle them in this country. This bill, however, would shut down that debate. If passed, S-2302 would eliminate virtually all nationals of Iraq, Syria, and other nations from refugee protection, regardless of how much they have suffered at the hands of terrorists. Men, women, and children trying to flee unspeakable horrors will all be cut off without further consideration should we pass this bill. Moreover, the bill contributes nothing substantial to the refugee screening process we already have in place. Refugees are already assessed by the FBI, the State Department, the Department of Defense, and individually interviewed by the Department of Homeland Security. Refugees are already required to submit biometric data such as fingerprints and face scans. The screening process for each individual applicant already takes, on average, 18 to 24 months. The bill makes no real changes to the vetting system, and there is a very good reason why. The system already works. It is one of the most vigorous and rigorous in the world. Mr. President, I must ask, why would a terrorist submit to such a comprehensive and lengthy process, which is almost guaranteed to deny them entry to the United States? In the past, terrorists have had much greater success reaching our country through student visas, which involves a less comprehensive screening process. The Senate has introduced legislation to strengthen that process, and our time would be far better spent on that than on S-2302, which would strengthen nothing but fear, division, and mist mistrust. I urge my fellow senators to stand in opposition to this bill, to rise above the rhetoric of fear, and to recognize that ISIS is our enemy and the people fleeing ISIS are not. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Thank you, Senator. Respond as it sees fit. And now we've arrived at my favorite part of the program, where we open up the floor to our visiting senators in training to make statements for, against, or simply in reaction to the bill. This is genuinely my favorite part of the program because this is the part that's different every time, unless no one says anything. And then it's the same silence. And it's horribly unfair. In the real Senate, uh, up until fairly recently, it was sort of expected that a freshman senator might wait a while before making their first speech on the floor. Uh, our institute's namesake, Edward M. Kennedy, was relatively quick in his day. He waited 17 months in his eagerness to speak on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I'm asking you to do it after 15 minutes of somewhat hasty analysis of the bill. But we would be delighted to hear statements for, against, or simply in reaction to S-2302. Two points of order before we begin. One, we are uh, at this stage unable to amend the bill. Now that's terribly unusual for the Senate, but for the purposes of today's vote, while we can talk about how the bill could or should be different, we cannot amend it at this stage. And two, because we've already heard from the experts this evening, we are currently looking for statements rather than questions. Would any senators be brave enough and gracious enough to offer us a few words for, against, or simply in reaction to the bill? We'd be delighted to hear from you. Chair recognizes, in the back, the senator from the great state of? Yes. <laughs> Why not? You have the floor, great Senator. St <laughs> great state of Massachusetts. Um, I am against the passage of this bill, and it's mainly because of my own experience with helping uh, refugees and migrants come into this country. I'm a social worker. I just would like to see people have a chance, and especially under the conditions that Syrian refugees uh, are, are fleeing their country. Why are we trying to persecute people who already have suffered more hardship than any of us, I think, can imagine? I had the honor of um, helping some Iraqi refugees uh, about five years ago who came into the country under a little better circumstances. But they basically had nothing except a hope of a job, uh, a hope to make their lives better, and acceptance um, into the community. I also had the honor of helping a woman from South Africa reunite with her children. Uh, she received a lot of um, uh, assistance from agencies that, that were set up, as we've talked about today, to um, help people set, resettle. And today, I, ha I have to tell you, this woman is working um, at a job where she's able to support her, her two children. She reconciled with them and brought them up from Georgia. 
and she is trying to go to school in the evening. Her kids are wonderful, uh, are contributing amazing things um, to Massachusetts. One of them is a wonderful artist, the other is a musician. So I'm mainly arguing from my own experience of seeing how people, how hard people are willing to work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Can we get a round of applause for the Senator from Massachusetts? <laughs> Chair recognizes the Senator from the great state of? Massachusetts. Glad to see you. Uh, good evening, gentlemen, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm originally from Somalia. Everybody knows Mogadishu. I used to work UN mission in Somalia, especially Black Haudan. What are you talking about? I worked here as uh, case management and Boston public school is a social worker. I by myself accepted as refugee in Boston, Massachusetts. So being a refugee is very, very painful. It is not the choice of the person. But it comes from political turmoil, dictatorship. In the United States, is land of the law. If something happens, every corner of the world, who first contribute? United States. I am against this bill. I am against this bill. Because you see refugee crisis in Syria and other parts of the world. You see the people dying, a family or five, husband and wife, thrown in the water, and jail that they wear on the beach. They are, there, they are not there for resources, but to survive. So this message is bottom of my heart. I'm now American citizen. I'm here to participate, to help the refugees. I believe both parties in America, Republican and Democrats, they are here to support refugees. In order to master the change, you have to change yourself. So America is role model all over the world. I'm against this bill. Thank you very much. We have in the back, chair recognizes the senator from the great state of? Massachusetts. We have an unconstitutional number of senators from Massachusetts, I think. But that's perfectly fine. Um, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Um, I think it's important before anyone undertakes a vote on this bill to understand some of the background that's not widely reported in the, either the mainstream media and I dare say many people even in this room are, are not aware of. Um, and I'm speaking to Syrian refugees in particular, that Syrian refugees are leaving to escape whom? Their own president who barrel bombs them and whole cities Imagine Back Bay bombed out. That's what of, you know, this very advanced, beautiful country has had to put up with. Peop uh, or are they fleeing ISIS? Are they fleeing the PKK? Are they fleeing the rebels who the US has invested in? So the US has um, skin in this game for having participated in, in uh, continuing this conflict amongst f at least four different factions. Um, then uh, my research recently on refugees who are coming into tiny islands in Greece on boats with um, fake life vests and risking their lives in cold water, in cold weather, to get to Greece um, you have to really believe that you are in danger in your own country to put your two-year-old into one of these boats and, and think that that's safer than staying in your own country. When they arrive in Greece, they're grateful. And by the way, not, a whole lot of them mostly just want to go back to Greece. They don't even want to come here. So 
I think it's really important that people have a really deep background on what exactly is happening before we decide we won't take anybody, um, including our own culpability in the conflict there. Can we get a round of applause for the Senator from Massachusetts? Yes, excellent. Chair recognizes uh, the senator from the state of? Massachusetts. Right, excellent. <laughs> Uh, in 1980, my husband and I and four children uh, sponsored a Vietnamese family. They were both people, but after they came, we realized that both people were the wealthy people. They were the people that could afford to give $10,000 of gold jewelry to their um, you know, captives to get out of the country. It was probably the most exhilarating and exhausting thing we ever did in our lives, but to this very day, we are Friendly, they live on the West Coast. I just recently came back from the wedding of the son that was born in the country, but the daughter had been married. Three years before that, she married a doctor. She's working for the IRS. She lives in a gated community. She's more successful than I'll ever be, but she, we just love them, and every time the mother and father see us, they just burst into tears. They're so happy because all nine of her siblings uh, did make it to the United States, and they are well-grounded, just contributing to our society here in America. And I also had a letter from Bavaria uh, from my friend in Munich, and they're settling quite a few refugees in, uh, in the tiny little place of Bavaria in her little tiny community. And she, was, she wrote the letter with such enthusiasm. It was grateful uh, to see that. So good luck to the bill. applause <laughs> for the senator from Massachusetts. We have time for at least one and probably two more statements. Would any other senators be willing to offer statements on S2302? Yes, chair recognizes the senator from? I guess Massachusetts. <laughs> well, um, the first reason that I am contra this is because it is against the history of the United States um, from hungry pilgrim persecuted um, Puritans, Jews, the happy ending of the story of those refugees was to come into the United States. And I think we had to continue with that tradition. It's what made this country great. Um, resources, I don't know if you have been in other countries, but this is the richest country in the world. We throw away food, we throw away clothes, we have cars, we have houses. Uh, there is territory that I had gone in Wyoming, 60 miles an hour, you don't see anything. This is a very rich country. I have faith in the intelligence. We are a superpower. Don't tell me that we cannot identify refugees from terrorists. Do you think that we can do that? I think we can do that. I, uh, that's the reason I am, I am against. And I just want to say that every night I cannot sleep well because I have a beautiful bed, I have all the food, and then I am thinking of a poor mother <sighs> being in a boat with those children in the ocean. And it's beautiful, that part of Greece, I had been there on vacation, but not when you are running with your children. I have four grandchildren, and I said, I wish I could give every child a bed and milk and cereal and peace. And I love this country too, but we need to separate. We need to separate, and I think we can do it. We have the best army in the world. We can separate it. Thank you. Thank you Round of applause. <laughs> Senators, we are now going to move to a vote. Now, in uh, the real Senate, we'd likely do a roll call vote. The legislative clerk uh, would call out each senator's name and you would voice your vote of aye or no, but many of us have shuttles to catch and that would take a lot of time and we don't have a legislative clerk. So we're gonna vote through our tablets. The real Senate has remained resolutely low tech, but we um, are going to tap a button to vote yay or nay, or as they voice it in the Senate, aye and no. Uh, just a reminder that a vote in favor of the bill and restricting refugees from the five countries listed would be a yay vote. A vote against the bill over here and against the restrictions on refugees from those countries would be a nay vote. Um, voting will open and I will give notice before it closes. Senators, you may begin.
Voting will close in three seconds. Voting has closed, and the results are in. And in this instance, Bill S-2302 has been defeated. Oh, and a, a touching display of bipartisan civility. That's my favorite part between the two senators. Um, senators, congratulations. Not every bill makes it through the Senate, as well you know. The Senate was designed as a deliberative, slow-moving body. It's not your job to pass the most bills, but the most thoroughly considered bills. If we take a quick look at national polling, here and contrast it with the votes of this chamber. We have up here the distribution of this chamber, 8% of the chamber voting for the, uh, for the bill and 92% voting against it. And here we have something else. And the answers are a bit reversed. This was a poll put out by a major news organization the same week that this bill was introduced. And the question that was put out to 1,004 people that were considered to be a representative sample of the country uh, was should the United States be admitting refugees from Syria? And 56% said no. No, the United States should not be admitting refugees from Syria. And 44% said yes. Uh, and if the poll is accurate, that would seem to be a fairly steep divide. Uh, this month, uh, as we've done this bill, we have covered, uh, we've done this program uh, about 47 times for uh, about 459 people, or rather, 400, yeah, 459 votes. Of that, 17% have voted for the bill. 83% have voted against the bill. Um, and the bill has uh, seemed to have failed about 87% of the time in this chamber, uh, which I think we can infer from that, uh, from that data that uh, this building is located in Massachusetts, I suppose. <laughs> um, so uh, it seems uh, to be different, but in a country as large and diverse as ours, opinions are bound to vary. I want to thank you once again for showing up to the Institute today and for acting as senators. This session is adjourned.